All right, Psalm 11, very short passage, but just as we've seen with every other psalm up to this point, packed with doctrine, all kinds of great stuff, no shortage of things to preach on. You know, when I get prepared for my sermons in advance and I look at a, at a passage and, and coming up, there's a lot of shorter psalms. You know, it's almost daunting. I'm thinking like, man, I hope there's, there's a lot to preach on. But you know what? I don't even have to think that because there's always a lot to preach on in these psalms because they're so dense. And you'll notice that tonight. I mean, practically every single verse is just, it, it could be taken and, and stand alone and, and have entire sermons preached just on one verse. That's how dense these these verses are, uh, love the book of Psalms. Well, let's dig right in here. Psalm 11, look at verse number one. The Bible says, In the Lord put I my trust. And this is a common theme. We're going to find this all throughout the book of Psalms. So I'm not always going to go in depth on this concept of, you know, putting our trust in the Lord. He's our shield. He's our buckler. You know, he's our defender because that is a common theme throughout all of the Psalms. But um, it's in here. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Right, the, the mocking of the people, oh, go, yeah, go flee like a bird into your mountain. Just because the Lord is our defense, the Lord is our rock, the Lord is our defender. But people want to mock at that. Look at verse number two. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. Now, last week I covered this and the previous weeks I've talked about this. The wicked man, the wicked person, there are people out there that are looking to do evil and to do harm and to do damage under the cause of Christ and to those that would be considered righteous. We know that the Bible considers those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as righteous people because our sins have been washed away and we have Jesus Christ and righteousness imputed unto us. We are righteous and there are people out there, not just your average unbeliever, but there are wicked people out there. There are children of the devil Sons of Belial, the Bible refers to them as reprobates that don't love the Lord and that are bending their bow. So what, what the analogy be given here, the, the imagery being given is a wicked person. They've got their weapon. They've got their bow. They're getting their arrow ready. They're getting their sights lined up. They're drawing back the bow and they're looking for the righteous to be able to let go and to, to, to destroy whatever they put in their sights on. But notice this, at the end of verse 2, it says that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. Privily means secretly or privately. It's something that they're doing behind the scenes. And this is how the wicked work. They don't do things up above, above board, uh, you know, so that everyone can see being very transparent. They like lurking and hiding in the shadows and setting traps for people. And, you know, they're bending their bow, they're hiding in the shadow, they're hiding off in the corner, and they're getting ready so that their target, their prey, is going to walk unsuspecting, not knowing that they're there to destroy and to damage. That is how the wicked do their work. The righteous are not so, right? The Bible says that we, you know, we're given a light. We're supposed to shine in the darkness. We're not supposed to put a bush over our light. Everything we do in this church, that's why we publicize everything. That's why we have videos streaming, broadcasting what's being preached this evening because we are trying to make it known what we believe in, what we stand for, the work that we're doing. Everything can be completely known. It's, it's wide open. We're not keeping secrets here. We're not hiding in the shadows. We're not lurking in the dark because that's what the wicked does. They want to be sneaky about it. They want to be, be um, subtle as the serpent is. The wicked are out to hunt and destroy the righteous. You don't always see it coming. That's why we need to learn about this. That's why we need to, to study God's word and see that these people are out there. Because you may be used to doing things out in the open and it becomes not as much of a thought to know that there's these people out there that are, that are hiding, that are trying to creep in. As the Bible talks about, you know, the false prophets that creep in unawares. They're trying to infiltrate. They're going to feast with you. When you gather together, they're going to have, you know, they have the eyes full of adultery, cannot see from sin. But on the outside, they're saying, hey, brother, hey, sister. But secretly, they're bending their bow. They're looking for the target whom they might destroy. 
and they choose their targets differently. One, they might be looking at a target that may be very solid and very strong because they're doing a great work for the Lord and they're going to do anything they can to try to knock that person out of the game because they're being too much of an influence on other people. They're being too encouraging to others. They're doing a, too much of a work for the Lord. They need to get that person down. Or they might be targeting the unstable souls, beguiling the unstable souls like the false prophets like to do. They come in and they like to separate themselves and they want to target the people who aren't as grounded and founded in their faith so that they could try to turn them away from the faith and try to turn them away from the things of God. They try to take the easy pickings as well as those that are making the biggest contributions to serving the Lord. There's many reasons why, I'm not going to get into all that, who they choose to target. But we all need to be aware, especially if you're serving the Lord, especially if you're upright in heart, that there might be a target on you. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to go and hide and get scared because we don't do that. That's not the, the Bible says that the Lord hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That is what God has given us. We're not to be afraid of this, but we are to be aware. We're, we're to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. We need to know that there are wicked people out there. We need to know that there's attacks coming. Just like um, you know, a good illustration was what was happening before service tonight with the kids running around and playing in the parking lot. You can't just be oblivious to evil people that might be around you. You could have fun, you could do your thing, but you need to be watching and paying attention to, to, your, to your environment and what's going on so that you don't get caught in a trap, so that people don't do bad things and hurt you. When someone's coming, you, you need to be aware of what's going on around you. And spiritually speaking, we need to be aware of the world that we live in. We need to be aware of wicked people. We need to be aware that this is, this is happening and that... Just because you may be righteous, just because you may have friends that are righteous, just because you may be going to a good church, doesn't mean that there aren't wicked people that are already have their bow bent and have you in their sights. They do this stuff privately. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 6. Of course, keep your place here in Psalm 10. One of the ways that the wicked work, and this is geared a little bit more towards the men, but applies to the women as well, Proverbs chapter 6, because we saw in Psalm 11 that what do they do? They bend their bow and they're, they're privily shooting at the upright in heart. They're hunting. What, what does the person do with the bow? They're hunting, right? And they're hiding and they're trying to get their prey. They're trying to get their kill. That's what the wicked people are doing to the upright. Well, look at Proverbs 6 verse number 23. We need to be aware of the adulterous woman. Because she acts just like the wicked person does described in Psalm 11, verse 2. Look at verse number 23 here. The Bible says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. So this is describing, hey, the, God's commandments, God's laws, you need to be studying this because what is this going to do? It's going to illuminate your understanding to understand when you, when you come across wicked people, to be able to identify them and not get sucked into their trap. It illuminates your path so you're not just completely blinded and, and walking in darkness so you don't see the trap that sprung out right before you. God's laws, God's word lights that path up enough to be able to say, oh, wow, there's a pit. I don't want to fall in that. I'm going to go this way. One of those pits being described here is the adulterous woman. She's a pit. She's a snare. She hunts for the precious life. We'll see that here in just a second. So it says here to keep thee from the evil woman, the woman who's out to harm, the woman who's out to do damage. You say, oh, I don't know there's women like that. Yes, there are women like that. There are women specifically that target married men just in order to get their trophy and to destroy their lives. And you know who, who's kind of a high target? Are people who are Christian, people who are trying to live a sold out life for Jesus, people who are trying to live better than the world lives. Those are the people that the wicked people really want to tear down. That's really a big deal to them. Oh man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this person. Here's this professing Christian. If I could seduce 
and destroy, that's what I'm really going to go after. There are people that think like that. I'm not crazy. It's, it's, it exists in the world. And the Bible tells us about it here. To keep you from the evil one, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Flattery is one of the ways that a person will try to seduce you to lie with them carnally, to commit adultery. They're going to shower you with all these compliments and try to make you feel good and butter you up and, and make you start to like them because you think that they like you so much because they're giving you all these flattering comments. In their heart, they don't care about you at all. They're just looking to destroy. It's a ploy. It's a trick. It's a facade. It's not real. And one of the ways that you know it's not real is because these wicked people take it too far. Because when they really want to try to get you, they lay it on thick and they flatter. They don't just give you the normal comment, the normal um, encouragement or compliment, right? You do a good job at something, someone compliments you, that's normal. Watch out for the person, you do a good job at something, or maybe you don't even do a good job at something, and they're just, people just cannot stop telling you how great you are and how strong you are and how handsome you are. Watch out for that. Don't fall into that trap, men. Don't fall into that trap, women. Guys can do the same thing to women. to tell them everything that they want to hear. Because they're after one thing and one thing only. There's many people out there like that. Let's keep reading here in Proverbs 6. Look at verse number 25. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. The evil woman that adorns herself just so that you can lust after her appearance and flatters with her tongue and bats her eyes at you. All of these different tricks and ploys to deceive you into committing adultery and so that they can take their prey. Look at verse number 26. For by means of a whorish woman. By the way, that's what this woman is. She's a whore. A whorish woman that wants to just commit adultery, find a married man just to, to sleep with him and, to, and defile his marriage, just to go out and, and lay down with any man that she could find, anyone that, that she thinks is just going to be a... a for, for whatever reason, just, just to lie down with them, to feel like it's some kind of an accomplishment. That's a whore. It's a whore. And it's a whoremonger for men to do the same thing. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. And the adulteress, don't miss this, the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. This is describing an adulteress, a woman that goes on the prowl, that hunts for men, that hunts for married men, because that's why she's an adulteress. She's going looking for married men, hunts for the precious life. The person who's trying to live upright in heart, the same people that in Psalm 11, they're bending their bow and privily uh, trying to shoot at the upright in heart. We need to be aware of this. Let's go back to Psalm 11. These people exist. They're out there, and we need to, to be in God's word. And that's just one, those are just one example, the adulteress. There's many more wicked people out there in this world that we need to be aware of, the traps that they set and, and the things that they do to try to, to try to hurt those that are living for God and just to destroy their lives. And that's why the Bible said there that the man's brought to a piece of bread. Why? Because you could destroy your life. No matter how well you think you're doing, you're going to be brought to nothing, to just a piece of bread to, to your name. Psalm 11, verse number 3. The Bible reads, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We're going to spend the majority of the time tonight just on this one verse alone. This is such a powerful verse. This is such a standalone verse. We notice in context here the concept of, hey, I put my trust in the Lord. And then we have to put our trust in the Lord because we know that the wicked are out there. They're bending their bow. They're trying to set traps. They're targeting us. They want us to get out of the fight. They want us to get out of the battle. And one of the things that the wicked are aiming for 
is the foundations, the foundation of your faith, the foundation of your life, the foundations of the things that are good and right, they're being attacked. And if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. The foundation is what everything that is built rests upon. The foundation is like the single most important part of a building. Because if you don't have a solid, strong foundation, anything that you try to build on is going to fall. It's going to collapse. It's going to come to nothing. If you build on shifting sands, it's going to fall. If you build on earth, it's going to fall. You need a rock. You need something solid. You need something founded and grounded in order to support whatever you plan on building thereupon. If the foundation is destroyed, nothing can stand on it. And we're going to see this concept in Luke chapter 6. Satan, the wicked ones, are out to destroy our foundations. What it is that we rest upon. Look at Luke 6, verse number 47. We'll see this concept brought home. Luke 6, verse 47, Jesus said, well, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth. So no stone, no rock, just upon, just upon the, 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 earth, the loose earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. When you build on something other than a solid foundation, you may build for a while and build something that looks great and actually be building, but if it's not on a, on a solid foundation... It's just a matter of time before something comes along, some trial, some storm, some flood comes along and destroys everything that you've built because it wasn't found and grounded. And Jesus is, is likening someone digging real deep, laying this solid foundation and then building a house on that, saying, hey, when that's built on that solid foundation, it doesn't matter what comes its way. The stream beats upon the house. The flood arises and nothing is shaking the house. It's standing firm. It's solid. It's grounded because it's on a good foundation. And the foundation that he's referring to here, he says, whosoever cometh to me. So you come to Jesus, you hear his sayings and you do them. That's the foundation he's referring to. Believing in Christ and then obeying Him and keeping His commandments. That is a solid foundation. That is a sure foundation. Unfortunately, those that come to Jesus, maybe they hear, maybe they believe, but they don't do his sayings they don't they don't do the works they don't do things you know it doesn't mean that they're not saved but their their life what they build with their life is going to be easily toppled they're not going to be founded they're not going to be solid in the word in the word they are going to be the, the lamp is not going to be lit in front of their feet because they're not going to have the wisdom because they're not keeping with god's word and they're going to be falling into the traps that are laid before them their house is going gonna, is gonna to be ruined. Jesus is our foundation. Now, there's multiple foundations that we're going to be talking to. And, and you notice in Psalm 11.3, it said, if the foundations be destroyed. It's plural. It's talking about more than one foundation. Now, obviously, Jesus cannot be destroyed. Right? Jesus is a foundation that cannot be destroyed. If we build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, that can never be destroyed. But what can be targeted and what can be destroyed is our faith in that foundation. 
Now, thank God, once you put your faith on Jesus, that foundation is there and it won't be moved. That salvation that you receive, that's on Christ, is there forever. Amen and amen. Isaiah 28, 16 says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Jesus Christ is that cornerstone. He is that sure foundation upon which we need to be building everything upon is the foundation of Jesus. If you don't have Jesus Christ, my friend, you are on sinking sand. You are on shifting sands. You are not on a sure foundation. Everything else changes. Jesus Christ does not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says that God doesn't change. I even I am the Lord, I change not. That's why it's a, a, a solid foundation. The sands, they change. The earth changes. It gets moved around, but a solid foundation does not change. It does not crack. It does not crumble. It's tried. That's why Isaiah 28 says it, it, it's a tried foundation. A tried stone. It's gone through the gamut of, of the testing of being beat upon and, and being tried in every way and put pressure on, but it doesn't crack. It doesn't crumble. It remains. That is the foundation that we have in Jesus Christ. Turn if you to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. We're going to see a little bit more about having the foundation of Jesus Christ and then us building upon that foundation. Because once you have that foundation of Christ, we do need to build thereupon. That is, that is what we're called to do with our life. It's not, it's not enough. I mean, it's enough to get to heaven and have Jesus, but it's not enough for, of what God wants from us just to, well, just have a foundation and not build anything thereon. Look at verse number 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Bible says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation. You can't lay any other foundation. That is a foundation that we build upon. Look at verse number 12. He says, Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, this is talking about the judgment seat of Christ. This is talking about the rewards that we will receive as believers, as people who have that sure foundation. The foundation is laid for every single believer, which is Christ. What you do with the rest of your life is going to be potentially gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, or hay, or stubble. What you decide to spend your time with in your life you're going to be building on. You're going to be building your legacy. You're building your name, building the works, whatever it is you're working with in this lifetime. It's being built on the foundation of your salvation. Some people go through their entire life and build things that are not sinful at all, but they're not things that matter to God. You can spend your entire life here as a believer focused on just pursuing things other than the things of God. Even if they're not simple, it's not simple to work a job, it's not simple to spend time with your family, it's not, you know, like, there's many things that are actually good, but if that's all you ever do, and if you spend all of your time doing things that really don't have any eternal value, what you've ended up doing is building wood, hay, stubble, you've built this, this whole house of, of sticks or a wood frame or whatever, 
and maybe, maybe it looks really nice. Maybe it's a really big house built on that foundation. But then the day comes where everything that you did is going to be tried by fire. And that big wood frame house that you built is just going to go up in smoke because it had no eternal value. It didn't matter. But the things that did matter, the, the, the silver, the gold, you know, anything that could pass through the fire and still remains at the end, that is of eternal value and that you will receive reward for. But it even says here, though, that if any man's work shall be burned, let's say everything you had is wood, hay, and stubble, and it just, pfft, well, there's a fire. Wow, that's what I did with my whole life. It's all gone. You know what still remains? The foundation. The foundation's still there. And that's why the Bible says, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so is by fire. You're still saved because the foundation's there. You can't destroy the foundation. That's Jesus Christ. Everything else might go up in smoke, but you can't destroy that foundation. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. Now I want to go to some other passages, or at least one other passage here, that describes other foundations or other parts of the foundation apart from Jesus Christ. Obviously, we have to start with the main, the foundation, the important foundation is Jesus Christ. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. But what we saw in Psalm 11 is if the foundations, plural, be destroyed, what can the righteous do? It's not talking about destroying Jesus Christ because he can't be destroyed. There are other foundations, though, that can be attacked, that can be destroyed, and that are targeted by the wicked. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse number 19 is where we're going to start reading. The Bible says, Now therefore... Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Why? Because they're saved. That's why it's saying you're no longer, you know, at times you were strangers, you were foreigners, you were separated from God, but now through Christ are you a fellow citizen. You're an heir. You're a joint heir with Christ. You're fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Verse number 20, look at this, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What is the foundation of the apostles and prophets? And then it says Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So Jesus Christ obviously is still there. He's the chief cornerstone, the, first, the, the most important aspect, the most important part of the foundation, but not everything because you still had the apostles, you had prophets, you had other men of God that are being used here as a foundation because they're working with God, because they're God's husbandry, because they're God's workmen doing the work for the Lord and, laying, and doing the work and laying a foundation in your heart to help establish and strengthen you in order to stand on and to help you in your faith and to be grounded in the truth. The foundation of the apostles and prophets, this can also be looked at as the word of God, too, just delivering the word of God. Verse number 21, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And this is giving more references to us, to our bodies being a temple for the Holy Ghost. That we are founded in Christ, and we need to build upon that foundation. We need to build upon what other people have done for us. That's the foundation that we're working with. It's what Jesus has done for us by dying on the cross and also what the apostles have done for us, what the prophets have done for us, what other men of God have done for us. We're building upon all of their work. We're laboring on the work, on the, on the sweat of what other people have done for us. That is our foundation. That's our starting point. And that is one of the foundations and that is also targeted. They're going to, you know, the attacks are going to come and the foundations are going to try to be destroyed. The foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the, the, the foundation of God's word, the foundation of believing these things. I think about different foundations, things that are, another word for, you know, foundation would be something that's fundamental, right? It's at the base. It's at the lowest level. The most important foundational principles or foundational things that we believe in, you know, as part, as, as an independent 
fundamental Baptist church, it's important to go over these things every once in a while because these are the fundamentals. And these are the things why you know, we focus. One reason why we're called fundamentalists is because we believe in the importance of the fundamentals of the faith that need to be just, just held to uncompromisingly. There are things that we will not back off on. There are things we are not going to say, oh, let's all just come together. Even though you don't believe the same as us on salvation, you don't believe the same on us as baptism, you don't believe the same on us about the Holy Word of God, you know, these are things that you cannot compromise on, that they are going to cause division because they are fundamentals. They are at the lowest level that, that need to be accepted and adhered to in order to, uh, to have any type of solid foundation in your faith. The fundamentals. What are some of the, the foundations of the fundamentals? Well, Jesus Christ and salvation, of course, is primary. That goes with who Jesus is. How are the foundations being attacked when it comes to Jesus? Well, how about the, the cults that have come up with another Jesus? How about the Mormons that are saying Jesus is, is Satan's brother? That he's not actually God in the flesh? Or Michael the archangel? or some other man that's not, a, that's not deity or, or whatever. People who come with another Jesus or another gospel, that is an attack on the foundation of Christ. And if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's why we need to watch out for the people who privily come in with damnable heresies denying even the Lord that bought them. The people want to come in and teach, oh, you've got to repent of your sins in order to be saved. You have to give up all of your sins. And, they're, and they're, they're talking to people who have maybe been saved for a long time and they've cleaned up their life and they start to think, oh, yeah, well, I cleaned up my life. So, yeah, I guess you have to give up your sins in order to be saved. You know, and, and people get, get deceived about this by, by these lying devils that come in trying to deceive the simple and trying to deceive those that aren't grounded and founded in the truth, in the fundamentals. That's a foundation that's under attack today. How about the Bible? God's Word. God's words have been under attack since day one. And yes, this is very important. This is fundamental. This is a foundation of our faith. The reason why we believe what we believe about God, the reason why we believe what we believe about Jesus Christ, the reason why we believe what we believe about everything is because it's written in this book. The Word of God. This is how we have our knowledge. More so than any tradition, more so than any passing down of, uh, you know, of stories, we have God's written Word for us today. And this is foundational. But going all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, 3, excuse me, in the Bible with Satan in the Garden of Eden, what's the first thing he's doing? He's questioning God's word. He's casting doubt on God's word. He is attacking the foundation of what God said. Now, we're going to be getting into that a lot more next week when we go through Psalm 12. So if you want to hear more about why we believe in the King James Bible, why this is the Word of God, why, how this has been preserved for us from generation to generation and will not be changed forever, will always exist. I should put it that way. This Word, God's Word, will always exist eternally. Because the devil has been changing it and has been trying to corrupt it and has made other fraudulent copies of this book that has been twisted into a lie. However, God's word still remains and is eternal and will be eternal. And that's what eternal even means. It's going to persevere. It's going to be preserved forever, regardless of how many perversions are put out there. But this is definitely one of the foundations that is being targeted, that the wicked have their, their sights set on, trying to destroy the Word of God. How about the church? In Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 25, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, I like to bring up this verse oftentimes about describing how important church is. 
the congregation of believers. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need, we need to be congregating together. We need to be coming together and edifying one another, encouraging one another, doing great works together, praising the Lord together, and hearing from his word together. We need to be gathering together and not forsaking that assembly. Church is so important. Christ gave himself for it. But what do we have going on today? We have people going, oh, I don't need to go to church. I have church right here. I have church in my living room. I have church when, when I read the Bible. I have church when we do, you know, you don't have church. Stop calling it church. Just because you want to justify how lazy you are and how much you really don't love God by just saying, by, by trying to say, oh, well, I just have church here. Oh, I turn on the TV or I turn on the internet and that's my church. It's not church. We broadcast our sermons, but if you're not here, you are not congregated. You are not part of this church if you are not congregated with the other people because that's what a church is. It's a congregation. It's not watching something online. It's not singing along with songs at home. It's not having a Bible study with your friends. That's not church. People need to understand, as the Bible has already explained in multiple passages in Titus and in 1 Timothy, why in the world would God dedicate any room in his word and in his in his words that we are to live by, why would he dedicate portions of his word to all these qualifications of a pastor, of a deacon, if church really wasn't that important? I'd like to know who, who's the pastor of your house church? Who's the pastor of your Bible study when you have all your friends? Who's the elder? Who's had the hands laid on them? Who has been ordained and given the authority of an elder in a church? The way that God has spelled it out. Who's done that? It's through ignorance that people say, as I already mentioned earlier today, you know, we're two or three to ga are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. That's not church. Nowhere in that passage does it say, well, then this is what church is when two or three are gathered together in my name. Without an elder, without, a without, without anybody holding office, without anybody running church, without, without there being... Um, everything that the Bible lays out as far as how you ought to behave yourself in church. As 1 Timothy 3.15 says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. How you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. And what's the house of God? the church of God. Yes, there is an importance to church. The Bible says it's so important that it refers to the church as the pillar and ground of the truth. We're talking about foundations. Well, what does a pillar do? A, a pillar supports weight. It's a supporting structure. A pillar itself is not a foundation, but what about the ground? Your ground is going to be a lot more, is the foundation. That's the lower part. The pillar and ground of the truth in the church. But what's, what's happening? The foundations are being destroyed. Churches are being split. Churches are being destroyed. Satan and the wicked people out there, his minions, the sons of Belial are out there trying to destroy churches. They're attacking, you know, Christians. They're attacking people. They're, they're attacking through the, the, the stupid concept of you don't have to go to church. Oh, you can just stay at home. It's really not that important. It's attacking God's word, foundation of God's word, saying, oh, how can we really believe that this is really what God's word says? I think you have to learn Greek. I think you have to learn Hebrew in order to even really understand what God said. And even then, we don't have the original, so who knows? Casting more doubt, trying to, to, to shake and to destroy the foundations upon those things which we believe. We've got God's word. We've got Jesus Christ. We've got the church. All important foundations of our faith. What about the family? The family is another important foundation of our life. You need to have a strong 
Family life. What's happening with that? The adulterous, the wicked people are coming in and trying to destroy families. Trying to rip parents apart from each other so that the kids grow up with just one, you know, single parent families and uh, just growing up in, in conditions that are, that are not uh, conducive for them learning and growing up to be better, better people because they're getting, they have the, the love of a mother and father and the proper discipline from both. They're not being brought into the church. All of these things are under attack. These are all fundamentals. These are all foundational aspects of our life that are under attack. Turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 6. We'll see some other foundations that are mentioned. And think about that verse. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? What are you going to do? If your church is destroyed, you have nowhere to congregate together because church is destroyed. That foundation is gone. Well, what are you going to do? People shake your faith in, in God's Word. Oh, it's not really preserved. Oh, we don't even know if any of this is true. What are you going to do? Then what do you choose? What, how do you pick and choose what you believe? Your family is destroyed. What are you going to do? How are you going to serve God? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. The principles are the first things, the most important things of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on unto perfection. Then he kind of reiterates, not laying again the foundation. The principles are the foundation of repentance from dead works. Now, I just want to point this out because this is a primary, this is an elemental thing. This is a primary thing. This is a fundamental thing. This is not supposed to be a difficult concept. This is not something that is so hard to grasp. The concept of repentance from dead works. What we have today, though, are lying teachers False prophets that creep in and want to take these words and twist them around to mean something else. Repentance from dead works is not repenting of your sins to be saved. Repentance of dead works for salvation is you trusting in anything that you think is considered to be a good work for God. That's a dead work. Jesus brings life. Your works don't. You need to turn from. You need to change your mind about. You need to stop believing that how good of a person I am, all my good works that I'm going to lay up without a foundation is going to get me to heaven. That's the dead works. Repentance from dead works because that's what everyone believes. Almost everyone who's not saved believes in one form or another that they're going to be saved, they're going to be okay, whatever their version of salvation is. And it doesn't matter what their view is on, on what happens after a person dies, they're going to think that they're okay if they do good or if they do more good than bad. And in one way or another, it boils down to their own dead works. And that's what you need to, to stop trusting in in order to be saved. That's all that means. Repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. Obviously, we need to put our faith in God. We need to put our faith in Jesus Christ in order to receive salvation. Verse number two, continuing on here. So it says, not laying in the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God. That's number one, salvation. That's foundational. We don't change on that. We don't yoke up with people who disagree with that. Verse 2, more foundational doctrines of the doctrine of baptisms. Baptism, yeah, that's pretty important. It's primary, it's elemental, it's foundational. Hence the name Baptists. It's pretty basic, it's rudimentary. It's foundation. Baptism, we believe in, in believers' baptism. As Acts 8.37 says, What doth hinder me baptize? 
If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he baptized him. And it was full immersion baptism, by the way. Bapti the, the foundations, though, are being attacked. We have people sprinkling, we have people pouring, we have people saying, oh, it's not that big of a deal. How about the laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment? All of these things. Laying on of hands isn't getting hardly any teaching. And, I, and I've gone through all of these one by one and preach entire sermons on these because they're fundamental. I'm not going to re-preach everything tonight, but the laying on of hands, you know, men of God being sent out and, and sent out to evangelize, sent out to start churches, sent out to do great works of God, having hands laid on them, having hands laid on sick. There, there's, there's, these things are basic. Basic things. The resurrection of the dead. The second coming of Jesus Christ. The fact that we are going to be resurrected. And the fact that Jesus Christ is the first fruits, and that those that are alive, um, then they that are his that is coming, and then, um, and then come at the end. And um, resurrection, very simple concept. Again, foundational. Uh, eternal judgment, hell. A lot of people, oh, I think hell is here on this earth. Oh, I don't, I don't think hell's a real place. Oh, I don't think people are tortured and tormented forever. The attacks are coming, and these are all foundational. And we need to fight for these. We need to stand up for this. We need to make sure we are solid in this, on these foundations. When we get these core doctrines and core principles settled and established, we can really continue to build and to grow. But these are the things that are being targeted. Doctrine is extremely important. As we saw there in Hebrews 6, 2, it says the doctrine of baptism, the doctrine of laying on hands, the doctrine of resurrection of the dead, the doctrine of eternal judgment. These are all doctrines. These are all things that you learn. They're teachings. People say, oh, I don't know why you focus so much on doctrine. Because doctrine's important, especially the foundational doctrines. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let's go back to Psalm 11. Psalm 11, verse number 4. Bible reads, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His, his eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. Let's recap Psalm 11. It's not, that, it's not that long. You have the upright or the righteous trusting in the Lord. You've got the wicked bending their bow and, and privately trying to, trying to shoot at them and destroy them. They're taking aim at the foundations. We need, you know, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And then you have God up in heaven seeing everything that happens. God on his throne. Why is God sitting on a throne? Because he's a king and because he's a judge. God sits on his throne and sees everything that happens. Another reason why we put our trust in him. We don't have to right every wrong because God, the judge, is sitting in his throne. And his eyelids, he's looking at, he's trying, he's seeing, he's testing, he's seeing what the children of men do. He beholds them and he tries them. He proves them. He, he sees what is in every man's heart. And he can see that by the way that they react to things and the choices that they make in their life. Verse number five, the Lord trieth the righteous. So we saw there, his eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The children of men is, is anybody. That's, that's the you know, unsaved people. Children of men, just your average person. He sees them and he tries them. But it's not just them. The Lord trieth the righteous. So we get tried. God wants to see what's in our heart too. We go through times that are not always easy for us. We go through trials. That's what it means that he tries us. We go through trials, hard times. He tries the righteous, says, but the wicked, and get this, the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Now, I covered this subject a couple weeks ago. But look at what that says. Does that say that the wicked things that a person does, God hates? That he hates the things? Because that's not what it says. It says the wicked 
and him. The object here of God's hatred is him or the wicked. Him that loveth violence. Him, they know what violence is. It comes to the root to the violate. Violence is when someone violates somebody else. The wicked that loves to, to do harm and to inflict pain and to violate, to rape, to kill, to steal from. The violent that love to do those things to other people. God's soul hates him. God doesn't hate Read Psalm 11. His soul hates him. I'm sorry if that doesn't match up with your view of God, but if that's your view of God, if it doesn't line up with the Bible, then you've got the wrong God. You don't know God. This is what the Bible says. And we need to make sure, going back to the first part of that verse, you know, the Lord trieth the righteous. We need to make sure that we don't fall into this thinking that just because, well, I'm saved, everything's going to be roses for me. Everything's going to be great. I'm not going to go through our times. I'm not going to be tried. Because the Bible says the Lord trieth the righteous. That it's the exact opposite of you thinking that's never going to happen. It actually is going to happen because God always tries. He, he does try the righteous. At least, at least we get tried. This is the wicked and that love with violence. His soul hateth. He doesn't hate the, the righteous. He doesn't hate you. You need to remember that too. He doesn't, he doesn't hate us. Just because you're going through a hard time doesn't mean God hates you. And some people might get that, that false perception too. It's important to understand God. It's important as believers to know who God is because you might be going through extremely difficult times and you might start thinking in your heart, you might have this wicked thought thinking, well, God hates me. Because I mean, why would he let me go through all this stuff? He must hate me. Not if you're a child of God, he doesn't. He loves his children. Now, he's going to scourge every son whom he receives. He's going to discipline. He may be angry with you. But he doesn't hate you. But the wicked reprobate that just wants to do evil and their eyes cannot cease from sin and they're full of everything that Romans 1 says, you know what? His soul hates them. He hates them. And they're going to be thrown into a pit of fire and brimstone. And it's not because he loves them. Verse number six. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares. Snares are just traps. He's going to, you know, he's going to entrap them in their own devices. He shall rain snares. Fire and brimstone and in horrible tempest. A tempest is just like a big storm. This shall be the portion of their cup. And, and anyway, I bring this up all the time, but it's important. And, and keep this in mind as you read your Bible. When, it's, when you see this word, the wicked, over and over and over again, I believe the vast majority of the time it's using that word and referring to a person as the wicked. It's referring to the reprobates. It's referring to people who are rejected. Because you look up, I mean, you read the book of Proverbs, you read Psalms, you read these references of just the wicked. Every single time their attributes are just lining up with a reprobate. With just the Romans 1 definition of a reprobate. I mean, we see here God hating him. We see here God doing all these things to the wicked, raining fire and brimstone. Upon who has the Lord reigned, ever reigned fire and brimstone? It's, to the best of my knowledge, it's happened one time in history. It happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what we can deduce from that? Those people were wicked. It wasn't just another lifestyle. Oh, it's just this other kind of love. Everything's fine. God doesn't hate them. You better believe he does. He rained fire and brimstone down from heaven. And you think that his mind has changed about that today? About Sodom E? Where do you think the word came from? Sodomy, Sodomites, Sodom. You know what? There's been attack on that foundation too because 
the majority of people in this, in this country or in the world probably don't even know what a sodomite is. And for all of you people who don't know what a sodomite is, it's a faggot. It's a queer. It's a homosexual. Hopefully that's clear for you. That's what a sodomite is. It's what the people in Sodom did. It's what the people in Sodom tried to do that the angels that came to Lot's house. And that's why God poured fire and brimstone down from heaven because they went after strange flesh. And you know what another word for strange is? Queer. It's the truth. Fire and brimstone. And look, there is no, there is no coincidence that verse 7 follows up verse 6 when it says in Psalm eleven seven, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. It just gets done talking about how God is raining snares and fire and brimstone upon the wicked. And then just saying, why? Because God loves righteousness. Because that's righteous. It is right. It is good. It is right for God to pour out judgment like that upon the wicked. It is a good thing. We don't have to have compassion or a soft spot on the wicked person that loves violence who God's soul hates. You need to have no compassion on them. If God hates them, what are you going to do for them? But again, this is talking about not your average unbeliever. That's not what this is referring to. This is referring to the wicked. They love to violate people. I don't know about you, but before I got saved as an unbeliever, I didn't just love to violate people. I wasn't just bent on doing everything I could in order for people to be hurt and to plot against them and to lay traps for people. And you know what? Most unbelievers are not like that either. But you know what? There are people out there that the Bible calls wicked that are like that that do take pleasure, as, as Romans 2 says, in them that do them. That not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. The, Lord, the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. Raining fire and brimstone, that judgment is righteous. God loves righteousness. We need to make sure that our views of right and wrong, our views of justice and judgment are not warped and twisted by the philosophies and vain deceit of this world and by the attacks on the foundations, by the devil and by the wicked ones that hate the upright in heart that are out to destroy them, that we don't let their influence warp our minds into not having a proper view of wickedness or judgment. And that when God brings forth his judgment on the wicked, we can rejoice. Like the Bible says in another psalm, that they wash their, their feet in the blood. Of the wicked. And when the raptured saints cry out to the Lord, saying, How long? How long, Lord, before you go down there and pour out your wrath upon this wicked people? How long is it going to be, Lord? That is a righteous request to a righteous God. because the wicked reprobates that take the mark of the beast, they're not trying to entreat for them. We saw Moses entreat for the children of Israel when God wanted to destroy them. And that was a good thing. And that was a right thing. But we don't see the people that get raptured trying to entreat for all those that take the mark of the beast and the wicked people are out destroying the saints. They're saying, how long, Lord? Aren't you going to judge? We need to have a, a balanced, a proper view balanced from God's word. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for 
your words, for the instruction that, that you give us. God, I just ask that you'd please help us to not be, um, not be swayed by this world's wisdom and, and by all the, the just bombardment of antichrist doctrine that's out there and um, just wickedness from the world, through the media, through everything, everything around us, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to stay grounded and founded and, and not to be shaken uh, in our beliefs that we would be resting on a sure foundation and building thereupon with good things, with the, the gold and silver and precious stones, as it were, instead of the wood, hay, and stubble. Lord, help lead us, direct us. Lord, strengthen our church. Strengthen all the churches that believe uh, in, in the true gospel and that are out there doing works for you, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us all to do a great work for you and that you would bless the work that's being done and strengthen us, dear Lord, and help us to do mighty works in your name to bring honor and glory unto Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.